I kept sending everybody who asked me about podcasting to every other resource I could. And every time they came back confused. So finally, I decided to create one training course that actually covers everything you need to do a podcast, both from the technical point of view, as well as from the business point of view. You are listening to EducationHackers.com, podcasting from Vancouver, Canada. Education Hackers highlights successful entrepreneurs with great online courses. And now, to introduce today's guest is e-learning evangelist, Steve Atwall. Today, I'm very happy to have Marin Barraquette on the show. Marin is a corporate refugee turned founder of the Inspiring Innovation magazine and podcast. Focused on helping people create freedom in their lives through entrepreneurship, he noticed something. The biggest struggle for aspiring entrepreneurs, he realized, was in finding an idea and a market to pursue. Being a podcaster, he knew that podcasting is the fastest and easiest way to build an online audience, authority, and income. With over 10 years' experience in radio and tech, he created the Podcast Incubator. It's the world's best step-by-step podcast training and community, and will take you from zero to launching a successful podcast in very little time. Marin, welcome to the show. I have to tell you, you have a course that's of great interest to me and all new and seasoned podcasters. Did you launch your own podcast called Inspiring Innovation before or after you created your course? Oh, way before. And if you actually follow the course, there'll be many things that you'll notice that I'm now recommending to do differently. Um, I used my podcast as a bit of a uh, crush test dummy and to refine and really see what's working, what's not working as much. And that podcast is actually what led me to creating that course because people kept coming to me. As you mentioned, I I did a podcast about entrepreneurship and people kept coming to me and say they want to become entrepreneurs, but don't know where to start. They don't have a million dollars idea. And I noticed that if they could start a podcast, they will be able to build their own audience and then just ask their audience what are they struggling with and create that and that could be their business. So that's, that podcast is actually what led to this course to be created. So everything you learned from launching and monetizing your podcast is distilled in your podcast incubator course. Is that correct? Uh, everything I learned, everything my good friends learned, I'm, I'm blessed to be um, kind of well connected in this niche and we're in, in such an amazing niche where everybody shares what's working for them and not, what's not working for them, etc. And, you know, knowledge is no longer a secret. If you go to any new media conference or to a podcasting conference like the podcast movement, you will see podcasters share everything with you. We don't hold secrets back. And all of that accumulated knowledge is distilled into the podcast incubator, which is my course. Yeah, that's amazing. It's a, it's a great, great community, the uh, community of podcasters. And it's no longer about trying to hide your idea or whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish, because it's always your slant on the podcast, your take on it, you, the way you present yourself and the, the way you format the show. It could be a TV show. It could be a solo show. It could be many different things. Tell us a little bit about your particular podcast. How, how did you format that? And why did you start that? So... I've been an entrepreneur my entire life, but when I was 17 years old, I was trying to get investors to invest in a company I was building. And I got an angel investor who said, if you, if you show me, you can execute a plan, I will put in money, right? So he gave me a plan. The problem was the plan wasn't very good (laughs) and the business crashed. So I had to make ends meet. I burnt out. I needed money. So I went and worked for corporate. And I was putting in 250, 300, sometimes 350 hours a month in my corporate job for almost two years. And I became incredibly, incredibly, um, I don't have to say depressed, but frustrated with where my life was going. I was putting so much effort in, and so many hours building someone else's empire. And... It, I've been volunteering and working in radio on and off for since I was 16 years old. So I was always interested in radio, but only around then I actually found podcasts. And I found Smart Passive Income with Pat Flynn. I think I found Leslie Samuel and a bunch of other podcasts. And those really got me re-inspired. And if, if you want, uh, put 
put the fire back into the entrepreneurial spirit and I quit my job. I had no idea what I wanted to do. I just knew that as long as I'm in corporate and I'm miserable, I'm not in a creative place. And then I got an opportunity, a new platform was released, the Apple Newsstand, where anybody can create digital magazines and have Apple sell them for, for him. And I figured, that sounds great, right? It's like knowing about Google before Google became huge. I thought digital magazines are going to be epic. So I decided to create a magazine. And then I was faced with deciding, okay, well, what would the magazine be about, right? And I realized what I really want to do is use this new platform and my experience in being on the radio and interviewing people to very deep levels to really interview entrepreneurs and try and get out of them something they never shared before or a, a deeper understanding of how they succeeded to inspire people just like me who are still trying to create freedom to inspire us and show us the way to do that. And that's how Inspiring Innovation was born. You were basically being burnt out. I mean, you were burning out in the corporate world. I don't know if you I was ever right. Got... <laughs> I mean, putting in 250 to 300 hours a month. I don't know if you ever got any sleep during that time. Uh, it was. It was about, um, well, if you do the calculation, it's between 12 and 15 hours on average I was working. So you, you started the podcast and the online magazine, the Inspiring Innovation magazine. So actually, they were separate. I first started the magazine, and that was running for a good few months. And then a friend of mine, one of the people I interviewed, Chris Ducker, he said, you should come and hang out at the new media expo in Las Vegas. And I'll meet, I'll show you around. Um, another friend of mine, Ralph Quintero from uh, The Great Business Project podcast was there. And they helped me meet everybody in the niche. And that's how I became friends with Cliff Ravenscroft and John Lee Dumas and Pat Flynn and all of those folks. And, and I was talking to John Lee Dumas about his, the success he was having with Entrepreneur on Fire. It was just launched. And he persuaded me that I need to give podcasting a chance. And I eventually did a couple of months later. And in three weeks, we had more downloads on the podcast than the amount of readers we accumulated in an entire year with the magazine. And that's where I knew, wow, like this podcasting thing really works. Yeah, that's powerful. And your main reason for starting both your magazine and your podcast, what were those main reasons? I just didn't have any direction. I didn't know what I want to be doing. But I knew I wanted, I was obsessed with spreading the word of entrepreneurship and helping others find solutions while I was finding it at the same time. I mean, I thought the digital magazine was a great business idea and that I will be able to live off just, you know, from the income from subscribers. That didn't happen, but it helped me create connections. It led me to launching a podcast and later on to launching my membership site. So it was a step in the way. I wouldn't say I created it to leave corporate because I left corporate before I actually formed the idea of inspiring innovation. So let's talk about, um, you know, people in general starting a podcast. Uh, one of the big reasons that people start a podcast is to build up the name, promote their brand, increase their authority in the niche, increase an awareness of their product. All great reasons. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> there, there are other reasons as well. Can you tell us a little bit more about the other reasons? Well, I would say podcasting is just the most effective way to do everything you just said and more. I mean, it's the most effective way for, especially someone who's getting started online, to build an audience, to become an authority and to build income. And I think podcasting is a great marketing channel. It's more rare that it is also a business. There are very few examples of someone making a business entirely and only out of a podcast, but it's a super powerful marketing channel that you could plug into almost any business to start getting new leads, new eyeballs, new connection, more engagement, bigger audience. And that is the livelihood of a business, right? Is having an audience that cares about your business. Yeah, that's, that's really true. Because if I look at uh, John Lee Dumas or any of the other big names, they started a podcast and then they started a membership site. So the podcast kind of, you know, naturally led to the membership site. Your podcast, is it leading people to your course and your membership site? So that's an interesting question because while the podcast led me 
to creating this membership site, Podcast Incubator, um, I would say that there isn't, it's not a perfect um, match between the, the people that listen to Inspiring Innovation and the people that are interested in podcasting. And that is actually one of the things I'm going to be focusing on in the next few months to actually separate these two brands and take the podcasting, uh, the podcast incubator down to people who need podcasting to grow their name, their business, their marketing, um, their authority if they want to become public speakers or trainers, etc., and take Inspiring Innovation down a slightly different route because the audience of Inspiring Innovation, they want to build a business, but they're not necessarily interested only in podcasting. And I think I've been doing them a disservice in the last year by only focusing with them on podcasting. So I think that's a lesson also. If, if, you, ha- if you start a podcast that isn't a perfect match with your product, you're going to have trouble converting the audiences. Yeah, that's, that's actually very true. Even if you look at Google and you do typical keyword searches and there's all, you know, there's all kinds of tools to do keyword searches like long tail pro is what I use. That, that funnel that you're using to get people to your product or your service, it has to be the right people. It has to be the right people, the right audience, your podcast or whatever it is that you're using to bring people to your product or service. It has to be the right people. Now, before we get into your online course, um, how do you like to relax? I I typically ask this question. How do you like to relax when you're not working? How do you unwind? Do you have any hobbies? I'm actually adopting a new hobby right now as we speak. Um, I don't know if you heard of Arduino. It's an open source hardware project. I, I suddenly saw it and I'm absolutely fascinated by being able to build cool electronic gadgets by myself. Yeah, it's a great product. It looks so cool, right? And since it's my birthday soon, so now I'm getting everybody to buy me like um, all stuff to do with um, circuit boards and stuff like that. And I'm going to start a new hobby, I think. And you're the first one I'm telling. <laughs> Even my family doesn't know that's what I'm getting for, for my birthday. But um, being a perfectionist, I decided that if I'm going to learn how to use the Arduino, why not go hardcore and first learn to build all these circuits with just resistors and capacitors and all the things geeky people did in the 60s. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, so I'm pretty excited about that. We'll see how that goes. I love music. I love listening to music. Um, I'm pretty much all across the board from classical to uh, rock to jazz. I don't like most of the new stuff. I'm a bit, um, I'm like a 60 years old. <laughs> um, uh, and I just love unwinding, sitting down with Julie, my girlfriend, and our dog, maybe watching something on TV or, you know, just having a nice cup of tea and having a good conversation. Do, do you live in the city? Uh, I mean, I've had some people on the podcast that have farms. Uh, I live in a rural area. So I have vast, huge fields of wheat everywhere I look, basically. And I absolutely love waking up and taking the dog for a walk uh, in the field. If people check me out on Facebook, they can probably find a few photos of that. And um, yeah, we tried, we did City Life. City Life for me is connected in my brain with my corporate days. So I don't miss it too much. (laughs) Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned Arduino because uh, when I was growing up in the UK in the 70s, we had uh, what was called Heath kits. So you'd buy these little kits and they'd have a a sort of a breadboard. And then we just plug these little transistors and resistors into that. And you could build a radio. You could do all kinds of different things. You see, that was my dream when I grew up, to build a radio. But we couldn't afford it at the time. That's amazing. Sorry, carry on. This is cool. Yeah, no, it's, it was interesting because I, I'm not sure if the company's still around. But I, I think you can still get stuff like that. But that's kind of outdated now. I mean, a lot of the stuff uh, that we get now... You don't, you're not really building with transistors and resistors anymore. You're building with, you know, something more complicated. And Arduino is a great, great little device, a great little circuit board that you can use to build other things. Yeah. And just for the benefit of those listening that are like, what are these two geeks talking about? What the hell is Arduino? It's like this chip that you can buy and it's very easily programmed and you can just plug anything and tell the program what you want it to do. So, You can build a water sensor to send you an SMS message when you have a leakage in your washing room or whatever it is. Whatever it is you can imagine doing with 
an electronic device, you can build it with an Arduino. Yeah, it's it's a very cool, cool uh, little device. I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes for anybody that's interested. <laughs> so what was your passion before you created your online course? My passion has and still is, uh, I would say three things. I love teaching. I've been doing that since I was 14 years old. I was involved in a project I was teaching in high school. When I was 17, I was teaching at the local college. I was teaching calculus, which was fun. And so I always loved teaching. I've always been obsessed with technology. I, I became a certified PC technician when I was 13, a Microsoft certified system engineer when I was 14. I was obsessed with technology. And you could guess I probably wasn't that popular back then. <laughs> <laughs> um, so technology and, and, and starting things and entrepreneurship, one passion, teaching the other and radio. I always loved the concept of radio. And I've been a radio broadcaster since I was 15 and a half. Let me first read out the sports scores after the news in a local radio station. And it was a match made from heaven. And I still do it from time to time. And I love it. Yeah, that's that's funny because my uh, number one subject in uh, college and school and college and even university to some extent in the UK was mathematics. Oh, no way. Pure mathematics, applied mathematics. I was the only person in college, and I'm proud to say this, in college when I was doing my A-levels to get straight A's in all my math courses. And uh, it was it was a subject that I found very easy to understand. Pure mathematics especially, it was very, very uh, easy for me to, to do with that. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, mathematics. And then there weren't that many computers around. We didn't have desktop computers. We had dumb terminals, huge, huge data centers where what they call dumb terminals because there was no graphical interface. It was just all text-based mm -hmm. and you could learn some programming. So I, I spent some time during lunch times learning to program in basic. Wow. That's ancient. <laughs> I'm not saying and like uh, I'm not saying that you are, but basic is ancient. <laughs> well, actually, it's funny you say that because Microsoft is still using basic or oh, Visual Basic. Sorry, I can see that when I start a podcast about Arduino, I have a co-host. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about your online course and membership site, podcast incubator. Give us a bird's eye view of the course. What do you cover? Who's it for? And why should people be signing up for it? So the podcast incubator is. The uh, you said that in the intro, and that's because I wrote that <laughs> that it's the best podcast training uh, and community resource online. The reason is was I kept sending everybody who asked me about podcasting to every other resource I could, and every time they came back confused. So finally, I decided to create one training course that actually covers everything you need to do a podcast, both from the technical point of view as well as from the business point of view. So the Podcast Incubator takes you from knowing nothing about podcasting to launching a successful podcast. And we do that first through going uh, through the business prism, which is what are you going to be talking about? What is your unique selling proposition? Why should someone tune into you? Then we figure out who is the customer avatar? What are their biggest problem? And how can we create a show that will be irresistible for them, that they want to listen to every single week because we mentioned quite a few good friends of ours that have podcasts. If you want to grab someone else's audience and if you want to grab a new audience, you better be solving a pain or an interest that they have that nobody else can solve as well as you are. So we have an entire module about customer avatar and unique selling proposition and all of that. Only then we move into setting up your studio how to record, how to edit. We have like 13 videos on how to edit like a pro. And then we have the launch plan, which is basically how to get you good rankings on iTunes. We have a collaboration going on with Spreaker, which is a new and promising podcasting network um, that they are promoting my students as well. And I'm proud to say that the Podcast Incubator is one of only 19 official affiliates of Libsyn, which is the biggest podcast hosting provider out there. Um, so that's a, the bird's eye view. We can dive into whatever you want. And oh, oh, I forgot. And we have the podcast incubator family, which according to many is actually the biggest thing. It's just the most engaged group of people sharing a passion to create a podcast for their business on Facebook. I never seen something like that. Nobody else that's on the group has ever seen something like that. It's just amazing. You have a group of people that are always there to help you make your podcast better. 
That sounds amazing. It's it's interesting that you mentioned Spreaker because that's where I'm hosting these podcasts. Oh, super cool. Yeah. And um, I looked at Libsyn, I looked at Spreaker, I looked at SoundCloud, which is still in beta in terms of the podcasting setup. And I looked at all, all of the different major hosts. And I settled on Spreaker for uh, lots of reasons, which I won't go into right now. But uh, it's a great, great platform. So it's interesting that, you know, you mentioned the Spreaker there. Well, one of the things I want to see my audience start doing that will also set them apart is using tools that are unique for Spreaker, like the live broadcasting stuff. It really makes it a more radio station kind of opportunity, right? It's live, have people call in, send in chat rooms, etc. I think Spreaker has a lot of interesting opportunities that can help people set themselves apart from just our, an, an interview-based show. Yeah, that's that's a really good point, actually, because they do have other features that you you won't find anywhere else. I mean, they have an app on the App Store, and you can check your stats through that. But one of the cool things that I noticed with Spreaker is that they're affiliated with iHeartRadio. Mm -hmm. Through the app, as long as you have five episodes out, it's one click away to submit to iHeartRadio through their app. Yeah, and just to give the audience and uh, the perspective of how big this is, iHeartRadio is one of the biggest online radio channels with over 97 million active users. I mean, that's a big reach that you're getting with a click of a button. Exactly. I mean, that, that's one of the reasons I really liked Spreaker is because of the setup, their audience. They have access to a huge, huge uh, potential market there where you, you can market your podcast or have huge listeners to your podcast. And the other thing is uh, they have nice players. So you can automate posting to YouTube. They'll create a, <laughs> they'll create the right embed codes and videos. So you, you don't have to worry about creating a video for YouTube. They'll automatically create that and post that on YouTube and uh, Facebook and SoundCloud and all kinds of different places. So it's, it's a really, really nice platform. Agreed. And I'm excited that other people are sharing my excitement about it. Oh, yeah. I'm really excited. I'm really happy so far. So your course and membership site has several different sections. We'll do a little bit of a deep dive into each section and we'll see what's what's in there. So you have the first section is videos. You have a bunch of videos. You have step-by-step -step videos to take that confusion out of the process of starting and creating a podcast. You talked about talk, uh, creating an avatar. Everybody talks about creating an avatar. Tell our listeners what an avatar is if they don't know what that is. Well, an avatar is basically like having a story about your number one listener. And here's why it's so important. I'll give you an example. I was writing for the last two days. I've been trying to write an email to my mailing list. And it's really hard to write like a human being when you're writing to a crowd. And in the same way, it's really hard to talk like you're having a real conversation if you're thinking of a crowd of 10,000 people or 100,000 or whatever it is. And an avatar basically is a story about your number one customer. But by targeting that number one customer, you target thousands of people that share the same social graphics or demographics. Now, what do I mean by that? So let's say I want to do a podcast about Arduino because we were talking about Arduino earlier. Well, I need to figure out who am I going to target? Is it going to be young kids at school or is it going to be uh, grown-up people driving their kids to school? And the reason this matters is that it affects the language you use. It affects the benefit you're going to be selling. If, if, if your audience is 20 years old, you can recommend specific pro product but you can't recommend products that they cannot afford, but maybe 40 years old can typically. If they are parent, you can use very specific language if your avatar is listening when they're taking the kids to or from school. So there's all these things that an avatar defines. It defines how much time do they have to listen to you. It tells you what other shows they are listening to so you know what you need to do better in order for them to listen to choose you over someone else. And by having that story about a person, and as I said, who are they? Where do they live? Do they have kids? What are their passions? What do they do? How does a typical day in their life looks like? How does the weekend look like? When, uh, the more detail you, you, the more deeper you can get into that, the better the understanding you'll have of what problems do they have that I can solve and become irresistible to them. 
That's something that you should really be posting on the wall in front of you and keeping that right in, in front of you so you know who your audience is. Oh, absolutely. It applies to everything. I'll give you an example. Even with my course, my avatar were the people that kept getting confused by other resources that are out there. And I'll say, for instance, Cliff Ravenscraft has podcasting A to Z, an amazing course. And you really dive in there to uh, sophisticated mixers and compressors and all sorts of technology that my avatar gets scared when they think of adding a mixer. They just want to podcast to get the benefit of podcasting. They don't want to have a big home studio. So by knowing who's my customer avatar, I was able to build the models modules in a way that is relevant to what they are looking for. So I'm not scaring them off. Because if and if I had my if my customer avatar was super techy, it would mean my videos would have to be more advanced, less basic stuff, right? So when you develop a course, as you said, Steve, you really need to know who is this course for. Otherwise, how the hell would you know what to create? Exactly. So it's interesting. You mentioned a few other people that are probably your, I would say, maybe slightly your competitors. So Cliff Ravenscraft and John Lee Dumas. How do you distinguish your platform and your course from these people? I think that it's the, I was actually taking feedback from students doing both of the courses. So I think my training is the best balance for those that are not the incredibly technical people. It's the best balance between having a really great community that in, is engaged at helping and isn't yet so huge that you don't know what's going on. Um, so you have a great community. You have a real step by step by step process that covers both from an, my deep understanding, I've been doing radio for 10 years. So I can teach people microphone techniques that other people don't or they teach bad microphone techniques. And by the way, I'm not referring here not to Cliff and not to John, just to clarify. But some courses out there are teaching very bad microphone techniques and stuff like that. And because of my experience, both with tech and with teaching and with radio, my training is really geared towards taking you step by step from knowing nothing to knowing how to launch a great podcast. Those other products are great products. And I think you, you mentioned the word competitors, but I don't see them as competitors. I mean, the ocean is huge. And some people, some customers would resonate more with, with my course and others would resonate more with Cliff or with John or with uh, Pat has a course, I think, and Fizzle has a course. And there are many other courses and that's fine. It's interesting. Everybody has a different slant. You have your own slant and, you know, the other people have their own slant. So don't be afraid to start something just because somebody else has something already there. Oh, absolutely. And I can tell you, I, I was I was postponing the launch of my course for a long time because there were other courses there. And it was actually John, John Lee Dumas, when I was vi uh, visiting him and uh, Kate in San Diego, we were sitting uh, at the San Diego Pier and he was like, when are you launching your, your course? And we actually have a module in my course that's coming up with John sharing stuff from his course with my audience because we are all about synergy and I'm a huge believer in that. So um, definitely, like, if in quotes, the competition is telling you to go ahead, um, as you said, Steve, don't let the fact that someone else is doing it stop you. Just create your unique selling proposition. For me, I have the community, I have the step-by-step -step videos, and I have the fact that I'm in the community commenting and giving my knowledge every single day of the week. So you get direct access to me. Now, you get that in some courses, but they are more technical, or you don't get that, but they are less technical. So I'm on a specific point of balance that either it's perfect for you, and then I'd love to work with you, or it's not, and I'd love to send to recommend you someone who is a better fit. That's awesome. It's great to see that People are communicating and working together and helping each other succeed. That's excellent. So you also have another section which you call over-the-shoulder support. You have checklists and fill-in-the-blank templates uh, to show you how to avoid some of the common pitfalls. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so for instance, we talked about customer avatar. And while it's great to have a video that tells you about customer avatar, we actually have a fill-in-the-blanks template where you fill in answers to four pages of questions about your avatar to 
flesh out who are they. Or we have a template for creating your title of the podcast and the talent name for the podcast and the description of the podcast. All of those things are things that you can do well or not so well. And we have templates and checklists that remind you, okay, every episode title needs to have this and this and that. Like it needs to have a benefit and needs to be short enough to fit in this amount of room. And it needs to um, make people to want to click while the title also needs to have a keyword. So we have checklists to remind you of all of that. So once you watch the video once, you probably don't want to watch them again. That's why you have a checklist summarizing the, the key takeaways from each video. So that's the checklist part. And as I said, the fill in the blank templates are just that. When you want to get podcast artwork, you need to get a designer. And here's where people get stuck. Because they either they have an idea and they don't know how to communicate it, or if you're like me and you're terrible with design, you don't even have an idea. But you need to create a designer briefing for a designer so the designer knows what you like, what you don't like, and they can create something because that's their job. But you need to give them guidelines. Do you actually recommend specific designers? Uh, no. I think designers are... It's it's tricky because most of them, it's really individual. I think if you can afford it, 99 designs is such a great option because you don't need to commit to a specific designer. You just pay a price and you set up a contest and you get hundreds of designers creating sketches and then you choose the designer you want to work with. Compared to going on Elance and starting to look for someone to create or stuff like that, what I would say is, when we create a designer briefing, we work through finding logos that you like and logos that you dislike. If there's a specific style that you like and there's another podcast with similar style, even if it's a different category, reach out and ask them who designed your logo. Actually, that's a really, really good point because when I look at the iTunes store there and I look at the podcast cover art, I look to see what sticks out for me. If there's some design or some text or some formatting, something that really, or the colors, something that sticks out for me, I look at that and I think, oh, th that would be kind of nice to have something similar to that with my logo, with my uh, name of my podcast and so on. Yeah, it's interesting because you say that you're not really a designer and I'm not really a designer myself, but I created my own podcast cover art and then I put it out there. I, I asked the community to to tell me what they thought. And I got some feedback and I adjusted and changed it a little bit. And then I kind of finalized it. And it's great to have that community. Yeah, community is huge. It's huge. And I recommend my students every step of the way to go to the Facebook group and share. You have an avatar, share it. See if it makes sense. Maybe actually your avatar exists in the group and they can give you feedback if you're making right assumptions or wrong. You have a logo, go to the group, share it. And I think what you did is brilliant. Like that's the only way to do it because none of us, if, if we could consistently, if, or had, had it Dale Carnegie put it, if any person could consistently make more than 50% of the time the right decision, he would be a millionaire in Wall Street the next day, right? Because you could be investing and making millions. None of us really make more than 50% right decisions. So it's better to get some opinions from others. Otherwise, just uh, invest in Apple stock, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so are these videos, are they, are they easy to follow for those that are not so technically inclined? Oh, yeah. It, it, as I said at the beginning, it was built for someone who wants to use the power of podcasting to build his name, his authority, his audience, and get more sales with podcasting. It wasn't built for the radio hobbyist or for a technical um, teenager or whatever. It was built for those people that want to tap into the power of podcasting and everything, even the technical stuff is built up one step after the other. And one of the key things that was important to me when I created this was to give you enough foundation for how your podcast is going to look like and what are you going to be creating, etc. Before we dive into the technical stuff, some people do it the other way. They jump right in to talk about RSS feeds and, and how iTunes works behind the scenes. I found that there's no benefit at <laughs> jumping into those details um, at all at the beginning. So yes, my course is 100% geared towards those that aren't necessarily technical, but want to use the power of podcasting to get all of these amazing benefits. And, and the other thing that you offer in your 
course and your online platform is the community. So you have lots of members in the community that are helping each other succeed. I mean, you're there as well. You're there a few hours every day answering questions. What are some of the, the big questions you get asked? People struggle with figuring out their avatar because I think many people who go to podcasting make the mistake of saying, my avatar is me three years ago. And that's really not specific at all. And it, it, it's a slippery slope because you think you know who you were three years ago. But when you start asking these questions, you realize that you actually don't really know what state of mind you were in when you just throw that into the air. So people have a lot of struggle turning that concept into a viable customer avatar that can, you can actually find more than one pe person like that in the world. Uh, that's one struggle. Uh, the other one that people struggle with, let me think, avatars is big, getting feedback on logos is big. Actually, let me just open, if you don't mind to wait a half a second, let me load Facebook. I'll tell you. So now we're getting an expert actually to do a live hangout, to do voice training because people were worried how to sound more professional, how to be better at reading a script, how to maintain a better pitch or maybe lower their pitch a bit. Um, that's one thing we talk about. Here's another question about logos. Um, people love getting help from others about how to create titles with strong benefits, titles for episodes that people would want to click on and listen to. Um, people share a lot of um, you know, questions on how to record in Google Hangouts compared to Skype, compared to all of those and best features there. Here's another one about logo. Here's one about um, asking for feedback on an intro script. People love getting help. Another one about logo. I would say the main one is avatar and logos and intros and stuff like that. The packaging. That's interesting. I see that a lot as well. People are not designers. Like we're not designers. I'm not a designer. So if I put something together, even my cover art, it'd be nice to have somebody tell you if it's good or bad. The other thing is intros and outros. People want to have a good intro and good outro. And sometimes, depending on your particular podcast, you, it may be just you. It's it's hard to put everything together unless you have some feedback. So that community is really, really important. And when choosing, um, you know, a podcasting training resource, I think the community is huge. I'm just looking, for instance, um, two days ago, someone started a discussion about logos. I know I commented there, but I can see they already went through 39 iterations. Wow. Like that's a very engaged community that's truly there to help each other. Some groups are like that as well. In other groups, I've seen that, you know, you get five, six comments and that's about it and it dies away kind of thing. So I'm so privileged to be surrounded by these people that are so passionate about helping each other grow. And actually, I'll tell you the truth. One hour from now, we have our weekly Google Hangout where we just jump all together in a video call and share. Everybody shares what's working for them and what's one struggle that they're having. And everybody in the group who can make it to the video call tries to help them out. So if you want it... If you will, it's like a mastermind. So you have live Q&A sessions, weekly live Q&A sessions. That's another aspect of your platform and your course. Tell us a little bit more about that. And what are the typical questions you get there? Oh, there we could go really, really technical. Like my site isn't loading very, is loading very slow and I don't know what to do. And we would do like, it's like, it's, it's like one-on-one -on -one help just in a group. But everybody can see we, we actually went through, uh, I made two webinars about speeding up your website just because a few of our, our members had issues with that. And we went through the settings, step by step, everything like DNS and plugins and whatnot, caching, whatever you want. <laughs> we went through that process. So Q&A, truly anything that somebody struggles with, whether it's with their equipment, with the software, with their hosting, whatever it is, we probably went through it in some QA and we're always happy to do it again. And by we, I mean me. Yeah, maybe you can tell me why my Ecamm cold recorder software just doesn't work properly with Skype <laughs> because I, mean, I tried the software and that's what typically is recommended for recording Skype calls on a Mac is Ecamm cold recorder. My setup is actually um, a Shure SM57 mic going into an iTrack solo, going into a USB port on, on a MacBook Pro. And 
the Ecamm Call Recorder software always records channel one, my side, at a very low volume. And I've checked all the settings, I've checked everything that I can possibly think of, and nothing seems to change that low volume on channel one. Now, if I do a, a test call to Skype, and you know how you do a test call to Skype and it plays it back, everything is fine. So I've now heard the issue down to Ecamm Call Recorder. I contacted their support a few weeks ago and they never responded back. So, <laughs> but I think that's, <laughs> a, I've seen that issue actually with other people. Other people have complained about the same thing. So it's not just me. I have seen other people complaining about the same issue. So how technically inclined does somebody need to be to use your course? You said they don't have to be that technically inclined. Not at all. I have people that used to be, okay, one of our members, and he went all the way to being in, I think, top three of new and noteworthy in his category. Um, and now he's starting a coaching business. He, when, when I go talking to him and he had some questions, I said, let's get together on Skype. And he emailed me back saying, what's Skype? <laughs> okay, and he went through the course with no trouble. So I think that answers your question. If you know how to listen to, the, to a podcast, you can go through the course. We, being techies, we assume that other people know what we know. And they can use the tools or they've heard about the tools that we use. But we assume a bit too much sometimes. I think more often than not. <laughs> so what hardware and software do you use to record your podcast? Okay, so I'm, I'm still trying to find a distributor in Israel that would sell me a Heil PR40. It turns out it's harder than you'd expect. Uh, so I'm still with an Audio-Technica ATR2100 connected to a Behringer mixer. It's recorded on a Zoom H4N digital recorder. And it's connected to their computer, actually with a big complicated bypass that I was setting up just before the call because my iMic adapter um, died on me. Time for dramatic music now. <laughs> Yeah, we won't go into that. <laughs> so I've seen some people record on, on an iPad or an iPhone. And there's a nice app called Boss Chuck. If you're doing a solo uh, podcast rather than a, an interview podcast like this one, if it's just you, Boss Chuck is actually a very nice, nice application that you can use. Yeah, it's a great tool. Actually, if... I did. Uh, I was sponsored by Boss Jock for one episode. They gave me a um, microphone and gear and everything to do an episode at the New Media Expo. And we actually did face-to-face -face interviews. So if you're right, you can do an interview-based show if you are not in front of someone. But otherwise, you can even do um, more than one person on, on the episode with Boss Jock. And yeah, you can do everything like intros, outros, effects, everything, bam, and do it all in one app. It's very cool. What software do you use to edit your podcast and why? I use Audacity right now. The reason is, is because that's, why, that's what my students use. And I want to know about any bugs in, in, in new versions before they do. So I can, you know, guide them through it. Um, I used to use Adobe Audition, which is a spectacular piece of software. It's actually easier to use than Audacity. The only problem is not only it's not free, the prices vary quite a lot. So in the US, it's a $19 a month product. In Israel, it's, you can't get a monthly deal. You need to pay like $1,500 for it for a year. When they announced that new price, I was like, okay, <laughs> never mind. I'm not paying you over $100 a month for editing. Um, so, well, I'm outsourcing my editing, but my VAs use Audacity now, according to my um, standard operating procedure of how to edit. And that's what I teach my students because it's free and it's the same whether you have Mac or Windows or Linux. Across the board, it's the same. They do use and we do use a few additional plugins, though, to make to get much better results. Yeah, it's a great piece of software and it's free. So you can't go wrong with that. And the next version is actually going to be finally closer <laughs> to the level of uh, the professional software. Stay tuned. More next. I wish there were a few extra plugins. I mean, to simplify the process of editing, I mean, you're getting into 
I mean, you have to go through several different steps to clean up the audio. And it would be nice if there were plugins that would kind of simplify that process. Not not automated because you don't want it automated. You do want that control. But maybe have a few steps. Set your equalizer at a certain level and your compressor and so on. And you go through these steps for almost all your recordings. It would be nice to improve that workflow a little bit. Okay, so I'll give you the good news. A, you can kind of do that with batches in Audacity, which is an option that I believe is available from the file menu. You can write a script of apply this equalizer and then do this and then do that, etc. That does it automatically according to your parameters. And the new version should finally support VST, which means uh, virtual... Don't remember the, the abbreviation. Um, but basically, it's the same format that plugins on software like Adobe Audition and every other professional software uses. So you will have A, much more plugins, and B, you'll be able to save a setting for guest channel and for Steve channel, etc., and just apply it and it will all work out of the box. Hopefully, it's coming in the next version. Yeah, I know there's, there is a batch process that you can that you can have. What I was thinking was you have this service called Ophonic and it kind of cleans up your audio and does a lot of different things. I'm not a, a big fan of it myself, but uh, a lot of people like it and it does do a lot of that stuff automatically for you. I would say it does, but it, I, I would say it doesn't do it really well <laughs> to my taste. How long should your intros and outros be? Do you have an average, you know, like 15 seconds, 30 seconds? I would say never more than 30, 35 seconds. That's like the absolute maximum, I would say. Um, it can go longer if there's really a good justification for it. But let's talk about what the intro should do. And out of that, you can conclude how long it needs to be. The intro should set a tone, get someone excited, and most important, deliver the benefit of the show and hook them to carry on listening. It's like when someone comes to your website, you only have eight seconds to convince them to stay. You don't have much more than that in audio either. And the intro makes you sound professional, gives a clear uh, reason, what's the benefit to the audience, and introduces you. And I would say it needs to answer three questions. Or I would say when, when someone listens to your podcast, they have three questions in, ma- in mind that your intro needs to answer. Is this interesting for me? Can I trust you? And is this a good match for me? So benefits, and tell them what it's about and what are the benefits, what are they going to learn, why should they trust you, some credentials or whatever it is that makes you trustworthy to talk about this. Or maybe it's the type of guests that you have every week that they should know about. And then, um, you know, deliver their, what am I going to get from listening and why should I carry on? Like, is this what I want to have in my life? Yeah, that's a that's great advice. That's excellent. So have you seen anyone launch a podcast with a sponsor already in place? If so, any tips on how to get a sponsor as quickly as possible? I know of a few people that are about to launch with a sponsor already in place, but I would say it depends A, who's the, who's the podcaster. If you have some credibility in your niche, there's a good chance that people will want to align with your name. I mean, if you already have some celebrity status in your small niche and assuming you're doing a podcast for your niche, so the audience will be well targeted. Or for instance, I know of a rabbi who's about to launch a podcast and he's getting a sponsor ahead of time because he's a well-known rabbi in the community. The audience is very well targeted. So the sponsor who sells product that revolve around uh, stuff that Jewish people need to consume, like it's wine for um, what we do on a Friday and stuff like that. Um, So it made sense for them to align early. So they actually gave them an early bird option to pay a fixed price, not based on downloads. And I think it goes back to, you know, making a good offer. They show them that the audience is going to be a big match that the rabbi already has a list of this amount of people. And even if only them will listen, um, being, you know, hearing about this great wine that they should buy for Friday every single week from their rabbi would be good enough for them to go and buy. And of course, we need to remember that sponsorships are between partly tax deductible for the sponsor to 100%, depending on your country. So it's it's marketing budget and they're going to spend it anyway. 
So sometimes it's easier to just ask. Yes, just ask. That's great advice. I mean, and make it targeted. I mean, if you go and pitch audible.com or Bluehost, they would say, show me your downloads because we have hundreds like you. But if you have a very well-targeted audience, then it becomes interesting. If you are going to do a podcast about fishing in the Great Lake area, I don't even know if that makes sense, if you go fishing in the Great Lake area, because I my knowledge of US is um, yeah terrible. But if you're going to do a specific podcast about local fishing somewhere, and it's relevant for someone with fish equipment store in that area to sponsor you, you you would be, it would benefit them if you offer them to do that straight out of the gate. And I would say if there are two stores, it's get even better because you can send them both a pitch where they can see that they are both CC'd to the pitch and tell them that you're only taking one sponsor. Ah, nice tactic there. <laughs> they will both be coming to you and trying to make sure that they get in, you know, rather than the other competitor. Excellent. So, I mean, your offer needs to be good and needs to make sense. Like if you launch a new podcast and you don't have a mailing list and you're only uh, counting on iTunes to give you the, the download numbers, that's 100% okay and fine. But I, most big sponsors would look and say, okay, get back to me in three months when you actually have some statistics. That's, that's an interesting um, point there because a lot of sponsors look at the download numbers. You know, how many downloads, how many plays have you had on, on your episodes? How do sponsors weed out podcasts that use tactics that generate download numbers artificially and not really have engaged listeners, like Twitter bombing, for example? Yeah, Twitter bombing is a big subject. And for those listening, it's basically um, using the fact that Twitter now has the media feed where you can click play on stuff from within the feed and posting your episode 20 times a day or whatever, sure, people, some people will click play because they have a huge play button on the screen, but nobody that's on Twitter is actually going to sit down and listen for a 30 minutes episode. That's not how Twitter works. Um, is that what you're referring to? Yes, talking about yes the same thing? exactly. Perfect. I don't know um, how they weed that out. They could, ask, they could start asking to see a traffic source. Um, some providers already have that. So you could see traffic coming from Twitter and they might start flagging that. I think not all of them are even aware yet that it's happening. And then the second, the second part is if you do Twitter bombing, as I said, you're going to get the play clicks, but nobody is listening. Your sponsors aren't going to get opt-ins. So let's say if it's more money, okay, maybe they won't notice. But if you have, if you're doing huge Twitter bombing, right, and you're charging someone $2,000 because of Twitter bombing that allows you to show enough audience to justify that, and they are not getting any opt-ins, they won't carry on sponsoring you. And the marketing guy who made that mistake and wasted $2,000 on you will tell that to his marketing friends. Exactly. And the word will eventually get around. I mean, it's a lose-lose game because sponsorship has to be a win-win. I wouldn't take a sponsor. I got offered recently uh, a, some mattress company wanted to sponsor my, my podcast uh, because of how important it is for entrepreneurs to sleep well at night. I was like, really? I, 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 I can't align myself with that. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> like, how many people in my audience are currently buying a new mattress? Like, what? So no, sponsorship has to be a win-win. <laughs> Otherwise, you need to go either with bad partners or with Twitter bombings or stuff like that. And you will burn out eventually. And once you burn out, you burn out for good. That's, that was a nice pitch, actually. You know, podcasters do need a uh, good sleep, you know. <laughs> good sleep. Yeah, it was reasonable. When I saw the beginning of the email, it was like, we are a mattress company. And I'm like, what? <laughs> but then it was like, huh, kind of makes sense, but still no. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> I think that would be kind of, yeah, it'd be kind of funny. <laughs> so what's your best advice to increase download numbers ethically? Have a great show. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, well, let's put it this way. If you're doing weekly, you can do a little bit more often because the iTunes algorithm currently likes more content. Um, but up to the degree where you will be overwhelmed and start creating stuff that isn't as good because that's it's not worth doing more episodes of bad stuff. But really zoning in, improve your 
metadata of the podcast, which is the title, the description, the artwork, and the names of the episodes. So A, it screams to your avatar. It pops out for your avatar when they are scrolling iTunes, looking for someone to listen to, make it pop out and make it communicate that this is what they're looking for. I had one of my students, he was ranking at number six in New and Noteworthy, but not getting almost any downloads. He, we talked about it. I helped him figure out a better unique selling proposition to communicate through the artwork. Just by changing the artwork, he got 732% more downloads. Wow, that's powerful. And you could do that with, you can add keywords to your talent name, to your title, or simplify your title. I, I think it's, it's, you know, you need to play around and every podcast is different. Every audience is different. So ask yourself, who is your avatar? What do they want? When they see the podcast, do they understand that they're going to get it? And am I delivering it as best as possible in the podcast itself? So I'm helping them. They are sharing it with their friends and the podcast is growing. Keywords are very, very important. I mean, it's, a, it's hard enough to produce a show, record it, edit it, have a website. And then marketing is huge. Marketing is huge. So having the, the right keywords, I mean, are there tools that you recommend? I mean, I use Longtail Pro for, you know, Google. It's tricky with podcasts because we don't have the same kind of information. Uh, some people say it's kind of safe to assume that keywords that people are searching on Google, people are searching for them on iTunes as well. I'm not sure that is the case, uh, but Apple doesn't give us a keyword tool yet. Uh, to provide us with better information. You can look and see what the biggest podcast in your niche are doing or the rising podcast, what keywords are they targeting and see if you can learn something from that. That's always a valid op option. You can actually talk to them and ask them what keywords they are targeting and what are their thoughts. And they might tell you tens, tens of keywords that they tried and didn't work out and save you a lot of time. Um, another way to to... You know, and when it comes to keyword, you mentioned you write the show notes. If you split, if you use Libsyn, or I don't know how it works with Spreaker because I never use their feed directly, but the, it kind of works the same. If you use a Spreaker feed or Libsyn feed um, and not, not through a plugin in WordPress for iTunes, you can have different title and different keywords on WordPress compared to your podcast. That's very powerful because the laws of SEO and iTunes optimization are kind of different. You might want to ta target really uh, high volume keywords in your podcast title and episode title that shows on iTunes, but very long tail stuff with long tail pro and stuff like that for the, for the blog. Does that make sense? I can simplify it. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it does make sense. You have to have the right keywords in the right places. Yeah, so you can target, you know, treat it as separate entities. You can have a different title on the WordPress post for the show notes and a different title on the actual episode on Spreaker or Libsyn or SoundCloud or whatever you use, something that many people um, neglect to use. And that's a great, a great opportunity to use long tail keywords to get more search. Um, more ways to get more audience, get interviewed on other shows, get exposed to other audience, co-host an episode with someone else from your niche. Go out there and meet people. Use social media. Uh, what else can we do? We, you can publish on, on YouTube and SoundCloud and other websites to get more exposure. And I think whatever, what any platform you target, it's all about who are you trying to get out there to listen and how can you engage and give them a great experience? That's great advice. Thank you so much for that. You know, there are tools out there. Uh, they're kind of coming into fruition right now. There are tools for keywords for, say, the App Store. I created an app um, myself, and there's something called Sensor Tower where you can search mm -hmm. for an app using keywords. And that kind of gives you an idea of what, what to use maybe, you know, to find your particular app. Yeah, Sensor Tower and those tools try to guess. They're somewhere between actual data and heuristics and estimations um, of what keywords other people are targeting, like other developers, what keywords are popular in search um, according to download numbers and stuff like that. Um, and they have a very interesting data model behind it. I have a few friends that are very deep into apps and are now testing whether it does a good job or not for podcasts as well. 
I would say the results are inconclusive so far. Yeah, no, I, I was thinking of apps specifically, but I'm sure that, you know, there, there are some services um, that are coming up. I, I don't have the names right now that are kind of targeting podcasts. And it's interesting because like you say, they're based on heuristics and they kind of, some of them are kind of guesses that, you know, because we don't have direct access to the Apple data. And of course, just to clarify, uh, podcasts are available not only for Apple, of course, but iTunes has the biggest market share in podcasts right now, which is why we care so much about getting the most amount of traffic possible from iTunes because they have over 575 active podcast listeners. Uh, sorry, 575 million <laughs> active <laughs> podcast listeners. <laughs> yes, it's definitely the biggest market out there. And there are other markets, but iTunes is the biggest. So what are some of the best paying sponsors that you've used and uh, that, are, that, that could be used for any podcast? If you don't have, let me start, but if you're getting started and you don't have enough downloads for a sponsor, what you can do instead of saying, this show is brought to you by sponsor name, you can say something like, let's see how we can phrase it. So the FTC, uh, the Federal Trade Commission won't be mad. Um, this show has been made a, um, possible thanks to a service that you are using. And you can use that um, to promote MailChimp if you use them for email services or Aweber or Bluehost hosting or whatever it is. And you still sound as if you have a sponsor. So you sound like an important podcaster, even though you don't necessarily, uh, you're not necessarily sponsored. So that's the first thing. You can use affiliate referrals as long as you don't say that you are sponsored. Um, you can use affiliate referrals to start making money with your podcast as early as possible instead of waiting to have enough downloads and stuff like that. There are many affiliate platforms that are worth checking out. You know, Bluehost pays nicely. Um, I think it's $65, give or take, uh, for any referral you send their way. Audible is very popular, even though I haven't seen it pay as much. I have friends making thousands over thousands of dollars with Amazon affiliates. Grasshopper, for those that have a business podcast, uh, Grasshopper, which, which allows anybody to create uh, toll-free phone numbers for their business. Grasshopper pays nicely as far as I know. Uh, let me think what else. There are many. I, I would say instead of starting from the sponsor, start from your avatar and what do they need? And then you can write like, if your avatar needs gardening equipment, then type in Google gardening equipment affiliate program and see who can be, who can you affiliate and send sales to? And by the way, if you start sending them sales, they'll be much more happy to discuss sponsorships with you when they can see you, at, you're actually already promoting them and helping them. Um, that's one tip or that was a few tips in one. I'm not sure I didn't count. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's really, really great advice actually, because you know, your whole, um, your whole advice on promoting a potential sponsor before they become a sponsor is is great advice because they'll see the numbers, they'll see the traffic coming from your particular website and your podcast, and they'll be happy to be a sponsor, I think. And uh, yeah, I would say uh, one more thing. Oh, actually, okay, so yeah, I, I kind of forgot it for a second, but here it is. And that's the point I was going to make from the beginning. That's when, you know, all the sponsorship stuff, that's all looking at a podcast from a point of view of a podcast is a business. If you look at a podcast as a marketing channel and maybe don't even get sponsored, right? But you're building a solid email list and you can ask that list, what are you struggling with? What are you working on? And stuff like that. You can develop a product and promote that in your podcast and make a lot more money than you would have made, made just with sponsorships. And I think you'll see many podcasters go down that road of instead of treating the podcast as a business, they treat the podcast as the marketing vehicle for their business. Yes, that's really good advice as well. It is marketing channel to bring traffic to your, to your website and your product and your service. And a lot of people do use it that way. Let's talk about some of the techie side of things in terms of your course, because our listeners are creating courses. They're either creating new courses or they're trying to enhance the existing courses. So that some of these questions, um, you know, are really geared towards them. Let, let's start by asking, what was the biggest mistake you made when you first started creating your online course? Creating it without pre-selling it. Without seeing if the market was there or if, if there was a demand for it. Right. I did a beta testing opportunity, but I gave that away for free. So I got very engaged people. But when we started 
selling it, it was initially hard to make that transition. So by having, and, and because we didn't even know if it's going to make money, by offering an audience an early bird access, you actually know if you have the audience to sell this to, because there's no point making a product that when you don't have who to sell it to, right? So yeah, validating before um, I created it would have, I would have still created it, but um, my marketing would have been probably much better than it is even today. I, I would say build a list and and then see if you can get that list to show up either for a webinar about this problem where you teach them about whatever your product solves and then at the end offer them an early bird access to the product or by doing uh, an email course for them that ends with an offer or something like that. But first step is bringing them to the list because you know what? If this product doesn't work, at least you have them in the list to try and validate the next product, right? And you can do that uh, by being helpful in forums and uh, communities and stuff like that and making sure that your profile has some URL that um, the best case is actually that leads to an opt-in page that lets people download the lead magnet most relevant to your audience. I'll give you an example. Tim Page used to have an opt-in of um, 10 most important resources for podcaster, something like that. That was his uh, lead magnet page. And everywhere he wrote, if you clicked on his website, you would see that. And he built a list of podcasters. So when he launched his intro production services, he had the perfect list of customers, potential customers. Making sense so far? For sure. Okay. So yeah, you can build. So we talked about forums and groups. You can start doing guest posting about your subject matter and in your bio, make sure it goes back again to that opt-in page. You can do... Uh, Facebook ads to promote your lead magnet or Facebook ads to promote that webinar where you are going to be validating if people buy it or not. Either way, again, bring it to your list and then take it from there is uh, how I would suggest doing it. Your list is a goldmine once you have that set up. So how long did it take you to start and finish your course? I worked like mad and did it in three weeks. So how many videos are there? There's 80 something videos. Wow. So you created 80 videos in three weeks. But I procrastinated for three months before. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think uh, a lot of us do that. We think about it, think about it, think about it. And then, say, okay, finally, okay, let's just click the start button. Well, here's the thing. I had, I had an accountability stressor, right? I was going to attend this event in the Philippines with Chris Docker. Or Chris Docker was hosting the event and he told me he's going to, shame me in front of everybody and kick my ass unless I create this course before I land in the Philippines. Wow. Which defined a three-week window to actually do it. And thank you, Chris. Thank you for that. Good motivation. You don't want to be called out in front of a huge crowd. <laughs> so, you know, when you created your course, did you have an outline or did you just click record? No, I had an entire outline um, because, again, I, I, everything was built from the point of view of my avatar. So I built... Um, this journey I need to walk them through in order to actually get to the point where they can launch. The launch. So I broke it down to modules that, um, you know, just I wrote it on a whiteboard. What's the journey they need to go through? So this is module one. And they can't go to module two unless they need to know A, B, and C, which means that needs to be in module one, et cetera. And I just structured the modules. And then I used um, something James Schramko recommended me called Format. Have you heard the format for MAT? Uh, yes, yes. Tell us more about that. So the format format <laughs> is basically um, a structure to um, build. It was it was made originally in in theory of how to teach stuff. So that's perfect for an online course. And it basically says that you need to go through four steps when you are teaching something. And I don't, and let me try and remember the steps because it's been a few months since I used it, but it was really eye opening. And once I used it, and I'll remember it in a second, I was able to just hit record, do the video and have almost zero editing to do, which was very helpful. Okay. So you define what we're talking about. Why are we talking about it? And then we define what needs to be done. And then you show how is it done? And then finally, uh, you do what if. What if this goes wrong? What if that goes wrong, et cetera? 
you do a recap, you give them the action point, and you're done with the video. And I actually wrote for every single video of every single module the four MAT for that video. So I wrote down what's the title of the video, why is it important, what are the applications, what are the impacts of using it, and what are we talking about, how is it done, and answering questions. And what, uh, what platform are you using? Are you using WordPress? Yeah, uh, Optimize Press with WordPress. And in terms of when you talk about completing a particular section or a particular area of the course and then moving on to the next, are you actually enforcing that or do people actually have access to everything when they, when they join? People have access to everything because everybody joins in a different stage. I didn't want to limit it because I hate when I'm being limited. But every module has a checklist that they go through and even though they can access everything, it encourages them, encourages them to use the checklist and go step by step. And everything they mark, they can see what they already completed. The system supports, it's called wishlist checklists. Uh, it supports opening and closing levels um, by what have you completed previously. I just haven't used it. Yeah, it's interesting. I've talked to many different uh, educators online. And slowly, people are getting into gamification when it comes to education and learning. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's things like badges and points so that you can show, show that you've completed, you know, this section or that section and you have a particular status, you know, in the online forums that you're more knowledgeable or you, you're just beginning. So people can see where you're at and when they're talking to you, when they're helping you. Are you uh, interested? Are you planning to do something like that in the future? I might. My my eyes are currently focused on the marketing because I think the the course has proved itself. Every student who went through it saw amazing success. I never had yet a student who paid money and didn't launch a podcast that made it to the top of new and noteworthy, to the top three of new and noteworthy in his category. So I'm just I'm not saying it's not a great idea. It is but there's only so much one person can focus on. So my focus right now is in getting more people into the program. Yeah, and you have some very, very good success stories. You had one person with very little technical knowledge start and then have a successful new and noteworthy podcast within just three weeks, I think it was. Um, yeah, we had someone who within under two months made it actually to number one in business podcasts, outranking Pat Flynn and John Lee Dumas and Amy Porterfield and Michael Hyatt and Seth Godin. And well, since she was number one, obviously she outranked everybody. Uh, at some stage, one of my students actually, uh, if you looked at the business, uh, I think it was business category, the top played episodes, the top downloaded episodes, four out of the top 10 were my students. Wow. So um, yeah, the system works. And the reason it works is because I broke it down to a system. It's not my unicorn, uh, unicorns and pixie dust magic. It's just a step-by-step -step process that was tried and tested enough times that it's ready for anybody to take it and succeed. That's powerful. Your system definitely works. So w where are you hosting these videos for your course? Are, are they on your website, Vimeo, YouTube? Uh, Amazon S3 and, and CloudFront layer in front of that. Amazon S3 is really powerful and they have a really, really good service. What payment system did you end up using and why? Uh, right now I'm charging with PayPal just because it was so easy to do. I wanted to use Stripe or something like that, but it's really lim The options you have when you are a business owner in Israel are pretty limited. So right now I'm with PayPal. Yeah, the other thing with Stripe, and you know, I mentioned this before, is that Stripe doesn't really protect your payment process. So you have to have an SSL certificate installed. So that's an extra step with Stripe. Which is not a bad idea to have anyway. I know Google are now adding to their algorithm uh, some added bonus for sites that do support SSL. So I guess we're all going to have it. It'll, it'll end up being just built in as part of the hosting plan, I, I'm guessing. I think that's the way it should be. It should be, Yeah, you should have an SSL certificate right from the beginning so you don't have to worry about it later on. Well, we're going to have to make that revolution happen, you and me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I have to talk to Bluehost. <laughs> How do you market your course? What's been most successful? Social media, blog posts, webinars? 
podcasting? My focus now is going to be webinars. And this is where having a podcast is so powerful. You create an amazing network, which is one of the benefits we didn't discuss. So the webinar that I'm going to be launching in the next few weeks, I actually have Amy Porterfield reviewing my Facebook ads and stuff before they go live and giving me tips. I have Stephen Essa, one of the biggest webinar experts out there, helping me actually build the slide deck itself. And both of them are doing that um, for, you know, just because of the relationship we created that started with me interviewing them. Um, so webinars and face, Facebook ads, sending traffic to a webinar and then email marketing are going to be my marketing focus this year. Excellent. Looking back, what was the one tool, software or hardware that you absolutely needed to create your online course? This was a hard question because... Like I was going to say like, okay, I needed to have my Canon 60D DSLR. But then I said, no, I could have done that with an iPhone, but I had a Canon, so I used it. And I went to say I needed ScreenFlow, but I said, well, I could have used iMovie if I didn't have ScreenFlow. So it's really hard to define could not use without. And I really want to make this super clear. No matter what your situation is, you can make this happen and launch your own course. I mean, all of the tools you're hearing about are all optional. I know people who made millions shooting videos from the iPhone 4 front camera, okay? That's like worst worst camera on a smartphone ever. And they made millions. So don't let whatever I answer now or anybody else answer on this podcast uh, stop you. And I hope you don't mind me saying that, Steve. No, for sure. That's great advice. Uh, I loved Optimized Press because it allowed me to build a membership site really, really, really quickly. Today, you can probably do that to some degree with lead pages as well. And I use both uh, lead pages for opt-ins and sales pages and Optimized Press for the internal pages. Optimized Press comes with a membership plugin, which is kind of big. That's kind of important. So that is what controls who gets access. But if you can't afford Optimized Press, you can start by launching on you know, Udemy or skill feed or somewhere like there and start building your revenue from there until you can afford buying wishlist or buying optimized press or even something more advanced and fancy like infusionsoft or entreport yeah th- we're getting into more money there when we talk about uh, entreport and some of the other content management systems. Soft, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So how do you support your members? You have a forum on your website, right? Is that part of Optimized Press? No, we're, we're doing everything through the Facebook group. Oh, okay. I, don't, I think the days of internal forums are over. The reason being that people just don't go there. People, Facebook groups work great because people are already on Facebook. Are you not afraid that Facebook might just you know, remove those groups at some point. I, I keep hearing, I mean, I was just talking to somebody yesterday. They were saying that, uh, you know, Facebook for some reason removed a bunch of users from their group and also changed the settings so that the notification settings for the group were changed and, you know, people weren't getting notified when people are posting in there. Have you noticed anything like that? I think you're not getting notified. You By default, default you no longer get notifications for everything that happens in the group. And I think that's actually okay because the more members you have, um, people get overwhelmed and just cancel the notifications if they get a notification for every single message. And for me, uh, the more members we have, we're actually getting an interesting engagement because Facebook is doing some balancing and it's interesting to see. I think here's the thing. Honestly, if it wasn't on Facebook in their phones, that everything goes with push notifications, that they can reach it anywhere and anytime, I have no doubt in my mind that we would never, ever have the same kind of engagement on any other place. Now, if Facebook closes it, I'm sure there'll be another social media platform by then that is on every phone that we can use. I don't know what it will be. Maybe it's going to be um, Elo if they ever become interesting. I don't know. No, I wasn't. I wasn't really uh, saying that Facebook would be closing the uh, the the groups themselves. But I've noticed that. Um, I mean, I use Facebook groups. I think they're awesome. I think they're, you know, it's where people are, and it's very easy to access on your mobile, on your tablet, and everywhere. And uh, actually, I had a little bit of a a feedback with John and his 
podcast is Paradise, when they had their mm -hmm. website and their forum on there wasn't really kind of up to snuff in terms of working on mobile devices. It wouldn't work mm -hmm. properly. It wouldn't even show up properly. So I kind of suggested multiple times that they might want to have a Facebook you know, group on there uh, as well. And now Podcasters Paradise have a have a huge Facebook group. <laughs> yeah, once that got set up, nobody nobody wanted to use the website forum at all. Right. So it's yeah, definitely I'm all for the Facebook groups for sure. And as you said it, that's where people are. Maybe it will change in a year and then we will have to adapt. That's our responsibilities. One of our responsibilities as content creators. Yeah, we just have to make sure that we're aware of any changes that Facebook makes. So that, you know, we don't lose some members. I've noticed, you know, some people are complaining they've lost members mysteriously. They randomly drop off their group for some reason. Yeah. Well, I would, uh, I'm a student of a, a student of a, one of one online course and they have a forum there and the server is so slow. It literally takes five minutes to log into the forum. And I told them like, why don't you start a Facebook group until you fix it? You'll get much better engagement. <laughs> and they were like, well, we don't want to build on a rented land. We were burnt with our Facebook page. I'm like, okay, but right now nobody's using the forum because it takes five minutes to load. Exactly. So you really need to, you know, pay attention to what win are you actually getting by ignoring this, this option of doing it on Facebook. Exactly. And there's also other options as well. There's Google, uh, Google Plus. Yeah, Google Communities, yep. So yeah, no, that's that's great advice to uh, have something that e that is easily accessible by your members, and it's very easy to set up because it's already there. The platform is already there. So, Marin, take a few minutes and offer your best, most practical advice to anyone thinking of creating their first online course or training. Okay, so wow, that that was a trick question. Um, my best practical advice: build your audience see what they're struggling with, validate that they want it, and then build it. And you can even build it over time. Like if you are going to teach them something, you can deliver it like a weekly webinar. So you only need to work on one week. And then when you're done with the first run of customers, your membership site is ready and you can open it, open it up to the public or open it up from day one, whatever it is. Um, but yeah, build your list see what's the pain, validate that they really want it and only then create it, and don't wait. That's great advice. Marin, we have come to the end of the show. I could ask you a ton more questions about your course, uh, about podcasting and marketing and setup and so on, but instead I'm going to leave a, a link to it in the show notes so people can visit your website and check it out for themselves. Thank you very much for being such an amazing guest on the show and for sharing such valuable insights and advice. It has been a real pleasure speaking with you. Where can people connect with you online? Actually, I would love to hear from people directly. So feel free to email me at my personal email to m, like Miron, at iipodcast.com. And I would love to catch up. You can check out podcastincubator.com or iipodcast.com. Those are my two main websites. Or find me on Twitter, on Facebook. It's pretty easy to do uh, if you know how to type my name. And I'm sure that will be available in the show notes as well. Thanks for listening to Education Hackers. Check out the show notes and click the Love It button at educationhackers.com to send us some iTunes love. Until next time.